Jeffrey Dahmer was born on May 21, 1960, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, to Joyce Annette, a teletype instructor, and Lionel Herbert Dahmer, a student at Marquette University working towards a degree in chemistry. While reports differ as to the attention or lack thereof he received as a child from both his parents, one thing is very clear. Things were not all sunshine and roses in the home, with his mom being described as argumentative, greedy, and needy of both pity and attention constantly. She required constant attention from Jeffrey's father when he was a toddler as she spent an ever-increasing amount of time in bed, recovering from weakness due to working herself into a state of anxiety over trivial matters. She even attempted suicide on one occasion via an overdose of pills she had become addictive to, Equinil, a drug described as a minor tranquilizer which has nowadays been largely replaced with benzodiazepines such as lorazepam. As a result of Lionel and Joyce's fighting and constant neediness, neither parent devoted much time to a young Jeffrey. Despite this, Dharma was generally described as a happy and energetic child, but he would later describe his argument-filled childhood as being of, quote, extreme tension and contributing to him becoming quiet and timid around his peers at school, although he did manage a small group of friends. Jeffrey, like many serial killers, developed a seemingly ever-evolving fascination with dead animals, progressing first from trapping insects in jars and then collecting dead animal carcasses where he would then dismember and store the body parts. He had a particular interest in bones and the sound they made while playing with them. The Dahmer family relocated to Doylestown, Ohio in October 66, when Jeffrey's mother was then pregnant with his younger brother David, whom Jeffrey was allowed to name. Two years later, the family moved to Bath, Ohio. As he entered into his high school years at Revere High School, Dahmer was considered to be a polite and highly intelligent young man, involved in tennis and briefly banned but he was known by classmates to have a drinking problem as young as 14, where he drank before, during, and after school, both beer and hard liquor, even going so far as to smuggle the alcohol into class inside the lining of an army fatigue jacket. Despite his intelligence, his drinking and apathetic personality resulted in him achieving only average grades. Dahmer discovered he was gay as he reached puberty, a fact he did his best not to divulge to his parents. As he got older, he began fantasizing about dominating and controlling another man, eventually attempting to carry out a rape fantasy at 16 he had conceived by hiding in the bushes with a baseball bat and waiting for a male jogger he had previously seen and taken interest in. Luckily, the jogger did not show this day, because if he had, Dahmer had planned to knock him unconscious and perform sex acts on his unconscious body. Dahmer describes this as his first attempt to attack another person, and apparently lost the nerve as he never tried this again once the jogger didn't show that day. In the summer of 1978, Dahmer would commit his first murder just three weeks after his high school graduation. With his mom having relocated to Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin with younger brother David, and his dad living temporarily in a nearby motel, Jeffrey had the family house to himself and picked up 18-year-old Stephen Mark Hicks four days shy of his 19th birthday. Hicks was hitchhiking to a rock concert in Lockwood Corners and agreed to go back with Dahmer to his house to drink alcohol. The pair drank for several hours while listening to music until Hicks finally wanted to leave, which displeased Dahmer. Angry, he came up behind Hicks as he sat in a chair and hit him twice in the head with a 10-pound dumbbell. Hicks fell unconscious and Dahmer strangled him to death before stripping him naked and masturbating over his corpse. The next day he dissected Hicks' body in his basement and later buried his remains in his backyard. However, his childhood obsession with bones would resurface, and several weeks later, Dama would dig him back up and pared his bones from the flesh, dissolving the flesh in acid and pouring it down the toilet, and crushing the bones with a sledgehammer before finally scattering them in the woods behind his house. 
After a brief stint at Ohio State University, Dahmer would end up enlisting in the Army, where he trained as a medical specialist at Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio, Texas. He would go on to serve as a combat medic while stationed in West Baumholder, West Germany. And like his school years, Dahmer's published Army reports in his first year of service describe him as an average to slightly above average soldier. But there was nothing average about his sexual behavior while there, as two soldiers attest to Dahmer raping them, one repeatedly over a 17-month period, and the other believing he was drugged and raped inside an armored personnel carrier in 1979. In March of 1981, Dahmer was deemed unsuitable for military service due to his drinking and was discharged, surprisingly with an honorable discharge, as his superiors felt his problems would not be applicable to civilian life. Dahmer would then find himself living with his grandmother in Wisconsin, where he was able to get a job and his life actually normalized. But when he received a note from another man offering him oral sex at work one day, his feelings of dominating and controlling another man began to resurface and caused him to begin to familiarize himself with Milwaukee's gay bars, bookstores, and bathhouses. And by late 1985, he had begun regularly frequenting the bathhouses, where he would have sexual encounters that he later would state, quote, trained him to view people as objects and not as people. This led to him administering his partner's liquor laced with sedatives and raping their unconscious bodies, very similar to his early unsuccessful fantasies of the male jogger. And he was actually able to get away with this behavior 12 times before his bathhouse membership was revoked. When this happened, he simply moved on to continue the practice in hotel rooms. On November 20th, 1987, Dahmer lured 25-year-old Stephen Toomey back to his hotel room from a bar, intending to drug and rape him. He claims to have no intentions of murdering Toomey, but that he awoke the following morning to find Toomey laying beneath him on the bed with his chest crushed in and bruised and bleeding from his mouth. He claims it was only then he noticed his own fists and forearms were bruised, but he had no recollection of killing Toomey, and that he couldn't believe this had happened. He dismembered and disposed of Toomey's corpse, keeping only the head for two weeks wrapped in a blanket, which he eventually tried to boil in a mixture in an unsuccessful effort to retain the skull, but it became too brittle and it too was pulverized. Despite his claims of not intending to kill Toomey, the incident caused Dahmer to begin actively seeking victims in gay bars and luring them back to his grandmother's home, where he would drug, rape, and then kill them by strangling them. The victims in this time frame were 14-year-old Native American male prostitute James Doxtater and 22-year-old Richard Guerrero, both offered $50 for differing reasons, Doxtater to pose for nude photos and Guerrero just to spend the night with him. An unidentified male was nearly a third victim in this spam until Dahmer's grandmother returned home and caused him to take his unconscious victim to the county general hospital instead of killing him. But his next victims wouldn't be so lucky, and on March 25th of 1989, Dahmer lured 24-year-old aspiring model Anthony Sears back to his grandmother's house and engaged in oral sex with him before again drugging and strangling his victim. He once again decapitated and flayed his victim, but finding Sears exceptionally attractive, he chose to preserve his head and genitals permanently in acetone, storing them first in his work locker and then in an apartment he would get in between stays at his grandmother's when she asked him to leave due to his late night rendezvous with young men and foul smells that had begun emanating from the basement and garage. It was at this apartment that his sick and evil ways would continue, and thankfully eventually end, but not until he killed many more young men in a similar fashion to his earlier killings. In order, these men were Raymond Smith, Edward Smith, Ernest Miller, David Thomas, Curtis Strouder, Tony Hughes, and Errol Lindsay before Smells almost got Dahmer caught when residents complained to the apartment manager. But Dahmer lucked out when he was able to explain away the Smells, first as his freezer breaking, and then later as the death of several of his tropical fish in his apartment. 
but this was nothing compared to the luck he would have on May 26th of 1991, when Conorak Synthesomphone was found sitting naked outside of Dahmer's apartment building by three young women who called police. Dahmer had earlier led Synthesomphone back to his apartment via his old tricks, and then drilled a hole into his skull and injected hydrochloric acid into the frontal lobe of his brain. When the youth had become unconscious, Dama left him there and left to have a drink at a bar and purchase more alcohol, only to find the young man sitting with the three women outside his apartment when he returned. Incredibly, the two responding officers, John Balserzak and Joseph Gabrish, simply covered him up and led him back to Dama's apartment when Dama said that he was his boyfriend. The women protested this decision by the officers and pointed out blood coming from Synthesomphone's anus and were told to shut up and butt out. When they got back to the apartment, Dahmer showed them nude pictures he had taken of Synthesomphone the previous evening to verify they were lovers. On top of all this, the officers would also later report smelling a strange scent reminiscent of excrement from Dahmer's apartment. Yet they still left Synthesom phone with Dahmer and told him to, quote, take good care of him. And after they left, Dahmer then injected more hydrochloric acid into his skull, this time killing him. Had the officers done even a simple background check, it would have revealed Dahmer to be a convicted child molester. Four more young men would also fall victim to Dahmer due to the officer's negligence, as he used his old tricks to lure and kill 30-year-old Matt Turner, 23-year-old Jeremiah Weinberger, 24-year-old Oliver Lacey, and 25-year-old Joseph Braidhoft. But his reign of terror would finally come to an end on July 22, 1991, after he lured 32-year-old Tracy Edwards away from a group of two friends and back to his apartment, where he attempted to handcuff his wrists together but managed to get only one, and told him to accompany him to his room and brandished a knife on him, pressing it against him and telling him he intended to eat his heart. Edwards continually told Dahmer he was his friend in an attempt to prevent him from attacking him. When Dahmer finally had a lapse in concentration and wasn't holding the handcuffs, Edwards punched him in the face and ran out the front door, where he flagged down two police officers and led them back to Dahmer's apartment. Jeffrey actually invited the trio in and admitted placing the handcuffs on Edwards, retrieving the key for the officers. But as he did, one of the two officers, Ralph Mueller, noticed an open drawer full of Polaroids. On the Polaroids were dismembered bodies. When Dahmer saw Mueller holding the Polaroids, he fought the officers in an attempt to resist arrest, but was quickly overpowered and arrested. The officers called for backup, and Mueller began searching the apartment, finding a freshly severed head in Dahmer's refrigerator. Dahmer, pinned to the floor, looked up and said, Quote, for what I did, I should be dead. In fact, a more detailed search revealed four severed heads in Dahmer's kitchen, seven skulls painted and bleached in his bedroom and closet, and loads of blood, torso parts, whole skeletons, and pieces of flesh in various places around the apartment, as well as 74 Polaroid pictures of dismembered parts. Jeffrey Dahmer confessed to having murdered a total of 17 men and committing necrophilia on most of them. He was charged with murder for 16 of them, with Stephen Toomey being the only exception, and was tried for 15 counts of first-degree murder. The defense claimed insanity, but it was rejected by the prosecution. The trial lasted two weeks, and Dahmer was found to be sane, receiving life imprisonment plus 10 years on the first two murder counts, and a mandatory life imprisonment plus 70 years for the remaining 13 counts. Three months later, he was extradited to Ohio, and charged with a 16th life term for the murder of Stephen Hicks. On the morning of November 28, 1994, Dahmer was attacked by a fellow inmate and was found laying on the gym bathroom floor with extreme head and facial wounds, having been severely bludgeoned with a 20-inch metal bar. He survived to make it to the hospital, but he was pronounced dead an hour later. The story of Jeffrey Dahmer is one of utter depravity. His crime so numerous and horrific that major charges seem almost minor by comparison. But they're not, 
and I'm sure mental health experts will spend many more years trying to figure out just what led up to the sick, twisted world of Jeffrey Dahmer. This has been Episode 1 of Murder Mondays. I'll see you next week.